Hello friends, in this video we will see how to calculate load on a beam and what are the different failure modes of a beam. So let us consider this roof structure. So this has multiple span. For example, here I have one span. This is another span of roof. This is another span. Similarly, we have uh, multiple span of this roof. Now the load of this roof, whatever the load that is coming on this roof, is basically taken by the beams. And in this case, we have two types of beam. This is the first type of beam and this is the second type of beam. So these beams are often called as joists and this we discussed in the previous video and this is called girder. So basically the first the roof load is transferred to the joists and then it gets transferred to the girder. Now one question here is how we can calculate load on joist and similarly how we can calculate load on girders. So for the calculation of load on beams we use a concept of tributary area. So let us consider this part of roof. So in this span whatever the load we have what we are going to do we are going to divide equally on the two beams. So this means half of the load of this span is going to transfer this side. This means this all load will go to this beam. Similarly, half of the load is going to transfer this side. In other words, these loads will come on this beam. Similarly, we calculate load on girders. For example, in this case, I have this girder. So what we will do is, on this girder, this beam is resting, that is a joist, and this beam is resting. So basically, there are two points. One point of contact is here, another point of contact is here. So whatever the reaction or shear forces at the end that is coming due to this joist, will be transferred at this point. Similarly, whatever the reaction that is coming due to this joist will be transferred at this point. This means half of the load that is coming to this joist will go here. Similarly, half of this load, whatever the load that is coming on this beam will get transferred to this on this point of contact. So main idea of tributary area concept is we have to divide area in such a way that equal portion of the load get transferred to different parts of beams and girders. And we have to make sure the width of the tributary area is perpendicular to the floor beams. In this case, this is the floor beams. So width is perpendicular. So we have to consider a perpendicular width. So let us illustrate this load calculation using an example. So here we have an example and this says if a floor beam has a uniform dead load of 90 pound per square feet, what is the uniform distributed load on the highlighted beam? So here I have one highlighted beam and then we have to calculate what is the dead load that is coming on this beam and we have to calculate uniform load in pound per feet. We have to also show this in a sketch. So indicate the load on a sketch of the beam. Draw the shear force diagram and compute the point load on a 20 feet girder. So we have to calculate the load on joist and we also have to calculate load on girders. So on this beam, half of the load that is coming from this side and half load that is coming from this side. So what is this distance? This total distance is 20 feet 
this distance is 10 feet so this distance is 5 feet now what about this distance this distance is 27 feet so one a span will be 9 feet and half of that is 4.5 feet so now I can show this tributary area separately so we have a beam and this is my area and this distance is nothing but 5 plus 4.5 that is 9.5 feet so if I take one unit of length in this direction that is 1 feet we can calculate load per feet of length this will be the uniform dead load is 19 pound per square feet so 19 times area that is 9.5 times 1 so if you calculate this turns out to be 855 pound per feet and this length is also given that is 30 at feet so now I can show this uniform dead load in a sketch so let's show this so we will have 855 pound per feet so we have this beam let's call this point as A and this point as B so this point is A and this point is B. Now on this beam we have a uniformly distributed load and the magnitude of this load is at 55 pound per feet and we have to provide supports at this point or the contact at this point that is basically coming from the girder. We can also show the shear force diagram. So this is a uniformly distributed load. So shear force will be linear in this case. And this value will be 855 times this distance is 38 feet times 38 divided by 2 that is 16.245 kilo pound same force will also come at this end that is 16.245 kilo pound so this is the load distribution on beam AB similarly we can calculate load distribution on other beams also for example beam CD we can calculate the load the only difference we will have that is width of the tributary area so in this case this is the tributary area and this width is 5 feet and this width is also 5 feet so we will have a width of 10 feet so load uniform load will be 90 times 10 that is 900 pound per feet so we can show this distribution so this is beam C D and this is 19 pound per feet and there will be 
reaction at this point and this point and this reaction will be 90 times this distance is 38 feet so 19 times 38 divided by 2 that is 1710 pound Similarly, we can also calculate load on this beam and why we are doing all this because we want to calculate the point load on the girder. So let's call E. So for beam EC, once again the tributary area is having a width of 10 feet. So we will have uniform load distribution of a magnitude of 19 pound per feet and this distance is 20 feet so the reaction that will come at these two points that is nothing but 90 times 20 divided by 2 that is 900 pound now we can calculate load on the girder this girder that is 20 feet girder so this distance is 20 feet. Now let's call this as a AF. So if I show AF, so on AF there is a point load that is acting in the middle. So this distance is 20 feet. So we will have a load acting at 10 feet. And the magnitude of this load is basically the reaction that is coming from this side and this side that is this value plus this value that is equals to 2610 pound and we will have a reaction at these points so this illustrates how we can use the concept of tributary area for the calculation of load on different beams, it can be joist or it can be girders. Or we can also calculate using this concept load on outer girders that is a spandrels. Now we have discussed how to calculate the load distribution. Now we will see what are the different failure modes of a beam. So we have primarily these failure modes in a beam so we can have a bending failure we can have a shear failure we can have a deflection failure that is excessive deflection lateral torsion buckling local buckling and finally we can have a local failure in a beam now we'll discuss each of these modes of failure in details The first is bending failure. Bending failure generally occurs due to crushing of compression flange or fracture of tensile flange of a beam. For example, let us consider this I-beam. In this case, we have a uniformly distributed load. Due to this load, there is a movement that will be generated across these sections. Now this moment will try to compress this flange. This means there is a compressive stress generated on the top flange. Similarly, there will be tensile force that will be generated on the bottom flange. If this tensile stress is high enough, in that case crack will develop at this flange. So basically it will cause fracture of tension flange. Similarly, if the compressive strength is high, the top flange will be crushed. The concrete will crush in this case. And finally, the beam will be failed in a bending. Second kind of failure that we have is shear failure. So this generally occurs due to buckling of bab of the beam near the location of high shear forces. So wherever we have high shear forces, generally we have shear failure. 
and this beam can fail locally due to crushing or buckling of the wave near the reaction of concentrated load. So wherever we have concentrated load, there is a chance of crushing or local buckling of wave and this is called a shear failure. And this is illustrated in this figure. If you see, there is a concentrated point load due to this, in this region of beam we have a high shear forces and due to this high shear forces, the wave of this portion has locally buckled and this results in a shear failure. We can have another mode of failure that is a deflection failure. Basically deflection failure is a service limit state not the ultimate limit state. If you remember we have discussed earlier that is there are two kinds of criteria there are two kinds of limit state one is service limit state another is ultimate limit state. So generally a beam is designed to have adequate strength which may become unsuitable if it is not able to support its load without excessive deflection. So we call a beam has failed in deflection when this is not able to support the load. This means it has excessive deflection in that case. For example, in this figure we have a beam and this beam has deflected excessively. And and this is not able to function properly. So we can say this beam has failed in deflection and resulting in a deflection failure. We can have another mode of failure that is often called as lateral torsion buckling. Lateral torsional buckling is basically generally occurs in cases of long beam. So when we have a long beam and it is loaded uniformly let's say then its cross section or the beam itself basically deflects laterally as well as it rotates. So there is a twisting as well as lateral shifting. For example, if I see one of the section of this beam and if I see this section here, this part has basically laterally shifted and it also has rotated. Initially, the beam cross section was straight, something like this. Now this cross section has basically shifted as well as rotated and this will look something like this. So we will discuss lateral torsional buckling in details. Also for the time being let us discuss a summary of lateral torsional buckling. So this generally occurs in long beam as I said. If I apply any form of distributed load on the beam the bottom flange in tension and the top flange in compression. So if you remember if I have a column and if I apply a compressive load this column buckles. Very similar to this now in this case this flange will try to buckle because this is under compression. But we have a wave perpendicular to this so it cannot buckle in the direction of the wave because of the restraint. So it has only one option. It should buckle laterally. This means it should buckle in this direction. So that the flange of this beam tries to buckle in the lateral direction. But the tension flange and the wave try to prevent this. And all this results in a lateral torsional, torsional buckling. So finally, if you see a cross section, it will look something like this. So top flange has laterally shifted and the whole beam has basically twisted. And lateral torsional buckling generally occurs in short beam. So if, uh, if you have a short span beam, for example, in this case, we have a short span beam. And if we apply a load W, then this beam will shift in the downward direction. So we have only deflection in the downward direction. So this is undeflected position of the beam and this has basically shifted in the downward direction. So this is the deflected position of the cross section or the beam. 
Now, if I have a longer span beam, in this case, we will have lateral torsional buckling. So, if I consider any cross section of this beam, for example, let us consider this cross section somewhere here, let's say. Now, initially, this is the dotted position and this has shifted in the downward direction. Also, it has moved. So, lateral movement is also there. So basically this has shifted in the downward direction, it has laterally shifted and it also has rotated. So there are three things that is happening simultaneously that is vertical shifting, horizontal shifting and the twisting. Now another mode of failure that we have often called as local buckling and this can happen in flange or it can happen in back portion of the beam. If it happens in flange, we call this as a flange buckling. For example, in this figure, you can see this part of flange has basically locally buckled. And we can try to reduce such kind of local buckling by providing a thicker flange. So flange thickening can reduce such kind of local buckling of flange. We can also have wave buckling. For example, in this case, this portion of wave has locally buckled. Now how can we reduce such kind of wave buckling? We can provide a thicker bearing plate and so that the load can be distributed in larger region. So at the concentrated load, a bearing plate is often provided to overcome such kind of failure. So if I have a bearing plate, for example, this is my concentrated load and if I provide a bearing plate, this load will disperse and it will basically go into longer region of the beam. For example, here if I apply this load and if I apply a bearing plate, this will go in this region. So less concentrated stress will be there and we can avoid web buckling and like columns local buckling is only an issue when we have cylinderness ratio of the local part that is greater than the prescribed cylinderness ratio so if my lambda value is lambda critical that is given in the code then only we have the local buckling that is either flange buckling or the web buckling so finally we have local failure and this generally happens in the web so we can have shear yielding of the web or we can have crushing of the web so let us discuss shear yielding of the web so in this figure you see this beam has been applied a uniformly distributed load and due to this load there is a high bending moment in the mid span of the beam and due to this bending moment stresses are generated and this stress can be greater than the yielding stress. So in that case basically material will reach yielding limit state and there will be a plastic hinge formation in the middle of the beam. So in such cases we will say that basically wave has failed in shear yielding. Similarly we can have local crushing of the wave and this generally happens at the support of the beam. For example let us consider this beam and this has been applied a uniformly distributed load. If I, if I draw the shear force diagram it will look something like this. So you see at the support you have a very high shear force. So shear stresses are high at this support and due to this material generally crushes and this kind of failure we call this as a local crushing of the web. So to summarize in this video we discuss how we can calculate the load that is coming due to the roof on different parts of the beam. And finally, what are the different modes of failure we have for a given beam? We'll discuss more in the next video. Thank you.